Good morning, everyone. Every year when November draws to a close, the same question is asked all over the globe. When is it okay for us to start to listen to Christmas music? When is it okay for us to put up the Christmas tree? When should I get the fairy lights out of the attic? How soon should we legitimately prepare for Christmas? Last week I was up on Newton campus at Bar Spa and I noticed a number of student flats were already decorated. Fairy lights had gone up and communal kitchens were looking festive. Milson Street's got its lights up, they're not on yet, but they're waiting to be switched on. And then there's a huge tree outside the Abbey, already lit, all ready for Christmas. And I confess, yesterday I went for a run and I was listening to my favourite Christmas playlist. Christmas is definitely coming. God started preparing for Christmas long before we might realise. Isaiah's famous prophecy concerning the child born to us was written about 500 years before the birth of Christ. Isaiah wrote at a time when life was really dark and the people were distressed and suffering. And as chapter 9 says, verse 1, everything was gloomy. Ahaz was on the throne and he was a bad king who disobeyed God and instead of standing up for Israel against the Assyrian armies, who were their common enemy. Instead, Ahaz pallied up with Assyria, leading the kingdom of Judah to face attacks from all sides. Things were really not going well for the people of God. Gloomy is perhaps a really apt word to describe the feeling of the nation at the moment as we come into this Advent season. People are stressed, struggling. Life for many is dark and feels hopeless. And whilst people are longing for Christmas, often the struggles of life become more pronounced at that time. As so much intensity, expectation and hope is around having a good time and enjoying ourselves. Not only will we be navigating the rules of how to bubble legally together and safely over the Christmas period, grief for many at that time will be more pronounced. Perhaps money worries will become more significant and loneliness can feel more acute. Isaiah 9 speaks very much to us in this season because it speaks to all broken people living in a broken world facing sin and sadness sickness and fear, isolation, anxiety, broken relationships and the frustrations of daily life. So whilst the situation 500 years before Christ was gloomy and 2020 will probably be remembered as a gloomy chapter for us, this chapter in Isaiah speaks to us of hope, hope in the darkness. And Isaiah begins with a promise in verse 1. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. There will be no more gloom. Instead, light has dawned. And with that, hope has come. I guess in the last few weeks of this pandemic, we have seen some signs of hope. Vaccines are more than on the horizon. They're coming. And we are hoping that we'll be able to see some of our loved ones for a few days over Christmas. And that virus, the virus is just that little bit more under control. Isaiah's prophes Isaiah prophesies that where once the land of Napoli and Zebulun were crushed by their enemies, God will in the future honour them as he honours Galilee. What a wonderful hint that is in this passage that Jesus is coming. And that this promise will be fulfilled when Jesus ministers in that whole area of Galilee as he walks from place to place bringing hope and light and the teaching that the kingdom of God is near. A great light has dawned and with that hope has come. And what a hope that will be. Nothing will be the same again. The darkness of the present will be banished and change will come. You see, the people have been walking in the darkness, living out their daily lives, unable to see and overwhelmed by the shadow and gloom of sin, disobedience and judgment. But this great light is the promise that Jesus will come 
and that his salvation will be light for all Gentiles, for all people. And the passage tells us too that the light that is coming will bring joy and lead people to rejoice. No longer will they be distressed. No longer will they feel overwhelmed by darkness because God has not forgotten them. Will they remember his past mercies and his goodness and promises to them? Will they be reminded again of his love for them and his commitment to them? Will they turn towards the dawn or linger in the gloom? You see, God is planning a rescue. He's looking beyond the judgment of those who are faithless like Ahaz. And he's offering a different future for all people, for all time. I wonder this Advent and this Christmas whether we will choose to focus on that light of Christ. Yes, this year has been hard and painful and a slog, but the light of Christ shines no less brightly. His light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot and will not overwhelm it, overcome it. Will we too remember and rejoice in Christ the light? Do you trust the hope that this light brings in this season? Do you trust that he's saved you and will one day return to bring you to his home forever where there'll be no darkness at all? Do you hold on to Jesus, rejoicing in his goodness and trusting in his promises? Has your joy increased as you've walked with Christ this year? What an opportunity we have in these next few weeks of Advent to be reminded of his goodness and his love and to choose to walk in the light instead of in the gloom. And as we do that, others will see as we deliver a thousand gifts to homes across our parish the light of christ will shine in those places as we gift hampers of food to some of the most struggling families in our community the light of christ will shine in those places and hope will dispel the darkness that is god's promise that is god's promise through isaiah to us and how astonishing that this hope that Isaiah tells us of should come in the form of a child. Hope in the form of a child. Have you ever chatted with a parent after the arrival of their child, particularly their first child? Within weeks, we can find ourselves making outlandish claims about the baby. He's so advanced. She's so well behaved. He smiled after a week. She's just so bright. She's going to be a genius by the time she's 18 months. Isaiah makes some extraordinary claims about the one who's to come, the one who will banish darkness and bring hope to the people. In the last couple of chapters of the book, Isaiah has been prophesying about Emmanuel, a child, God with us. A child who may look like an improbable answer to the problem, But just as Gideon's victory over the Midianites was astonishing, as we can read in the passage, so too this child will be, because he's not just any child. He will be the royal son of David. Yes, perhaps initially that was understood to be Solomon, David's literal son. But fundamentally, the Messiah, God's chosen and anointed one, described here as the wonderful counsellor. One who is to come, who will carry out supernatural, wonderful things that will cause the world to marvel at him. Because no one will have wisdom like him. No one will speak as he does or have the effect that he does. And he will be a mighty God, a warrior who brings unmatched strength and power. He's the creator of all things, who knows us and loves us. He is God himself and worthy of our love, our praise and our worship. So too, he is the everlasting father. He has the qualities of a perfect father. His heart is for those who are helpless. His compassion is beyond all other. He is the everlasting son of an everlasting father who gave up everything for those he loved to the point of death. And he's the Prince of Peace. 
He is the one that will grow up to enable peace between God and people, transforming lives and transforming all relationships. This child is the Lord Jesus, the light of the world, the one whom Isaiah prophesies about, the one who grows up to be a man, the God-man, who brings salvation for all those who trust him and whose death and resurrection have brought peace between God and people. He is perfectly God and perfectly human. He is perfectly wise and perfectly powerful, perfectly compassionate and perfectly able to deal with our sin and our brokenness. Yes, these are outlandish claims, but they are true claims a trusted prophecy and a hope that God's people can rely on for all generations, for all time. As we come to Advent, this is the Jesus we prepare for. He has already proved himself and lived up to his name. He has already proved himself to be our eternal ruler and the only one who rules with complete justice. We remember him coming as a baby into poverty and obscurity. We remember him dying as a man in humility and obedience, but we look forward to his return in all splendor and glory. That is the hope that sustains us through a pandemic, through economic insecurity, through the grief of losing those we love, through isolation and anxiety, and yes, through a Christmas that perhaps we don't feel that confident about. Verse 7 in the passage ends with these words. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The salvation of the world is God's work. God has not forgotten his people. He had not forgotten Israel despite their disobedience and sin. He has not forgotten us in all our brokenness and sin too. God's loving plan was always to rescue his people. We've seen that as we've studied Exodus. And his plan was always to send his son, just as Isaiah foretold. Let's not fret away these next few weeks as the world around us struggles to work out how to bubble how to get their gifts to their family on time or gets angsty over when to put on the latest Michael Bublé album. Let's rejoice and be joyful that in Jesus Christ, the light has dawned, the darkness has been banished and we have hope for eternity with him. And let's take the good news, that good news, out beyond our doors as we spend time in our bubbles and as we reach out to our community, to our school, all across our parish.